of all the new programs that are going to be introduced on CBS and Channel 11 that have been inaugurated this fall, probably the single program would be of most interest to people in this area, be the one that Mr. Will Gear, my guest, is going to be a, a star of. That's called The Waltons. As you know, it's a story about an Appalachian family during the Depression. Now, Louisville, proper, geographically, Mr. Gear is not really a part of Appalachia, but so many people live here, you know, who come from Appalachia, that I think they'll be examining those shows very, very minutely to see how, how accurate they are. It is about real people. That's what I like about Earl Hanmer, Jr. He's written it about himself, really, you know, much in the same way Thomas wrote, wrote about his life over there in, in the border town. You get a chance to read the scripts, and I'm sure you did before you accepted this part as Grandpa in uh, The Waltons. Did it have, did it smack of Authenticity, thing, yes. yes. It was real. It was, uh, had a sense of nostalgia to me, because I grew up in those times, and, which were after all the times of the Depression, when the big cities, they were selling apples. FDR was there trying to change things, and the Prohibition was there, and we were trying to change that. And they were trying to change a lot of things. We were trying to stop war and stop fascism, and at the same time, we had struggles, uh, aside from our own heart struggles in our home. But we had courage. We had a lot of courage, I think. Uh, the ability to know. Uh, Robert Frost said the saddest thing in life was the best thing in his courage. But to us in those days, the happiest thing in life was the courage that when we got knocked down in the gutter with no money at all. And script. my mother was a school teacher up in these parts, and she didn't even have money. They had paid her in script. And yet she had the courage to come on, and when the kids at school would present her with a red apple, it meant something because she could carve it up at night. On the other hand, there's a, a mm -hmm. thread that runs even to today. Appalachia, you know, has it has a tremendous depression now. Poverty there. If we could recapture some of the courage we had at that time now, it would be a great help. I know people say, well, what is there so comic about the Depression? How can you laugh about anything in the Depression? But I assure you, we did laugh. We laughed our way right through the hard, rocky times. Your career goes back some 50 years. Were you very active in your profession as an actor during the Depression years? Oh, yes. Yes, I managed to work somehow. I didn't make very much money. But we had the Federal Theater, of course, in those days. I was with Orson Welles in the early days. We did the broadcasts of Were you with the, the Mercury Mars, the Mercury Theater. And before that, I was in tabloid and boat shows and, and played Louisville even as a, an actor on the first radio station you had before you were a network. That's with our sister radio station. Yes, it's a pri it was a prize drama play at 26. And I was a young Texas cowboy to Nance <laughs> O'Neill's passionate senorita and a voice down like this. <laughs> <laughs> lower than yours. Yes, lower than mine. <laughs> you seem to have great gusto. Now, you're the one person we have met. We've met a lot of people from mm -hmm. CBS over the months. And they always send us little biographies of them, mm -hmm. but they always put their the month and the day they were born, but never the year. You're the one person apparently is not vain about the fact that he's... Oh, 70. no, I'm part of this century, uh, almost to the start of the century, I would say. I'm way past Medicare, but fortunately I haven't needed it yet. You're what, 70 years old? Yeah, plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm grandpa. I'm a grandpa on my own with several grandchildren. And uh, I enjoy being here, Mr. Matt. You look like you go up a couple of good rounds, uh, Mr. Kier. I'm a gardener. I'm an arduous horticulturist. And I have a good vegetable gardens on the East Coast and, and a couple in California. <laughs> You're a two-coast gardener? Yeah, yeah two-coast. I'm like right the birds, you know. I believe in going south in the winter and and uh, and coming up north in the summer. But this summer I'll be, if you live long enough, everything in the world will happen to you. And a television series is happening and I have to work in the summer. <laughs> I get the impression that you are one of those actors who is not snobby about where you act. If you think the the vehicle is the right one for you. I mean, some actors might look down on a TV series. Oh, no, I don't know. I think I'm very happy and very glad to be in one. Some people might think it's a form of retirement for Grandpa to sit in a rocker, you know, in these cup and saucer dramas. But uh, there's a lot of vitality in life in the old boys yet now, and I, I, I enjoy bringing that out, too, because all Grandpas haven't given up by any means. <laughs> <laughs> what about the humor in the Waltons? There's plenty of it, I Spice. think. And you as your audience as the year... Time goes by, and, and if you take it to your hearts the way I hope you will, because you're always saying, oh, crime and violence, and there's grandma getting cut and open in the hospital, and, and there's cops and there's robbers. Why can't we have something? And here it is, a play about real people and family life, and I hope you as an audience take to it and warm up to it and cuddle it and keep it, because we're all very much alike underneath, and there's a lot more of this country under, under corn still and under concrete. Mr. Gear, do you feel that the basic verities of life, the human values that count for most 
are any more prevalent in rural areas than they are in the city? I think we're less afraid to bring them out. In the city, we, we tend to cover them up. And in the uh, country, I think we're a little more open. We aren't as suspicious about people. I read Walt Whitman when I was a boy in high school, and the school teacher came along and she said, what are you reading, Will? And I said, well, Walt Whitman says, oh, don't read that man. He was a very lascivious language. He was a socialist and a friend of George Sands. <laughs> Immediately, I proceeded to read everything of Walt Whitman. And one of the first things I read in Walt Whitman was, passing stranger, why shouldn't I talk to you? And I made it a hobby in life to talk to somebody every day of my life and get a I've only had my face slapped once. Once or twice I got called a dirty name. But by and large, people aren't as suspicious in the country, in the Midlands, as they are in uh, New York and on the coast. And after all this, the Waltons, we're aimed for the heartland, the heart of the people. Isn't that a wonderful name for the, the yes. heartland, not the Midlands? It's you know, when mm -hmm. I hear the cadence of your voice, I love your readings. I see you reading, and I've heard you, uh, mm -hmm. Thoreau, Sandberg, Walt Whitman, Robert Frost, all those great American poets. I know how much you must enjoy that and what an actor such as you brings to those great words of American uh, poets and writers. If I had one advice to give to any young actor, oftentimes they ask you that, is to learn a poem every day. Learn a poem every day of your life. Have you a short one? A short one? Well, I don't know. It's Chaucer, this life so short, the craft so long to learn, the essay so brief, so sweet, the conquering. <laughs> Mr. Wilgear, the star of the Waltons, mm -hmm. many thanks to you, Thank sir. you. Thank you.